This class really gives the, the backdrop to what Brother Thomas wrote in our early Christadelphian brothers and sisters looked at, that we're going to look at it in our third session, and the excitement that, that came into our community, that we're seeing the tail end of those events. And what happens today is, is incredible, but it's the tail end of what has been taking place over many, many years. So just to plug back into our context, we're now looking at the sixth trumpet. So we're back in Revelation. We were looking at Revelation chapter 9, and we're now um, looking at the sixth trumpet, which is dealing with, it's the second part of the chapter, and it's dealing with um, the angel that's going to sound about the going out of the, the uh, Euphrates. So this is dealing with the judgments again on the Byzantine Empire. And, um, and as we look at these things, I mean, I, I understand this is a lot of history and that's not everybody's thing. I mean, I, I get that. Unfortunately, it is my frank thing, so you kind of get, you know, inundated to a degree. Um, but what, what you've got to take away from this is this is the veracity of the Word of God. It's the truth of it, the accuracy that's given in the details. Because it's impossible to be able to predict these kind of events ahead of time without having some kind of divine um, understanding of what's going on. That's why John's able to do this, because it's given to him by the angel, uh, but from the Lord Jesus Christ. So Revelation 6 and verse 13, the sixth angel sounds, and he hears a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, the sixth trumpet messenger, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Okay, so this is four angels who are messengers who are going to loose uh, these these powers, or this sorry, this trumpet's going to loose the four angels or messengers that are going to bring about a message. We'll look at what that is. Um, but they've been bound for a period of time, and we say, well, what exactly does that mean? Well, if you think about Second Thessalonians chapter two, um, and, and I can probably stand on what Brother Frank, no doubt, talked about a little bit last week. Um, if he's anything like his brother, which I'm sure he is. And that is, you know, the, the man of sin of 2 Thessalonians 2. There was a power that was withholding, right? It's the same word. It was restraining or it was holding back. And once that power was released, the man of sin came forth. And that power, of course, was the pagan Roman Empire until it was out of the way that we read about in 2 Thessalonians 2. That restraining was done and then that, that Christian Roman system could, could break forth. Well, that's the same idea here. These angels have been bound, and they're bound in a river. So you look at Scripture and you say, okay, well, what do we understand by a river? So Jeremiah chapter 47 and verse 2, we read, Thus saith Yahweh, Behold, the waters rise up out of the north, and shall be an overflowing flood, and shall overflow the land and all that there is, or is therein. So this is a symbol that he's using about waters overflowing a river. And the cities and the people that they're going to flood are going to howl. The noise of stamping of hooves, of strong horses, the rushing of chariots, the rumbling of wheels. And this is what's going to happen when this great nation comes in and overflows this geographical area and, and runs through this whole land. So that kind of a concept has already been given to us in Scripture. So the overflowing of a river is a military power that overflows the area that it's in into the surrounding nations and wreaks havoc upon them. That's Jeremiah chapter 47, and uh, much of the chapter deals with what's going on there. It's also a period that's given to us in the 15th verse, similar to what we've been just looking at. In chapter 9, verse 15, the four angels are loosed, and they're prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year, and they're going to slay the third part of men. Now, this is a little bit complex. Um, if anybody was at Shippensburg, Brother um, uh, Steve Hornhart dealt with it quite a bit in the, uh, in the uh, sessions there. But really, this is how it breaks down. An hour is equal to 30 days. A day is equal to a year. A month would be then 30 days, which would be equal to 30 years using the prophetic time period. And a year is equal to 360, so a total period of 391 days and one month. Um, that gives you, or 91 years and one month. That is the prophetic time period, and the principle, just to cite it to you, is from Ezekiel 4, verse 6, Numbers 14, 32, and the Lord Jesus Christ refers to it in Luke chapter 13, verse 42 as well. 
So these are the day for year principles. This next system is going to be in operation for about 391 years. Um, okay, so what else do we know about it? Chapter 9, verse 16, the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them, or two myriads of myriads, or 200 million, or whatever you want to call it. But the idea of it's a great number that would overflow during this period of 391 years, and they're horsemen. And the idea there is used with the cherubim, other places, they're vehicles of God's will, things that go out to accomplish his purpose. Well, what is that purpose? It's given to us in chapter 9 and verse 18. By these three was the third part of men killed by fire, by smoke, by brimstone, which issues out of their mouth. And the rest of the men, which were not killed by the plagues, repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship the devils, the idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood. Interesting use of all the metals there that's actually the image. Which neither see nor hear, nor work. And they're also involved in murders, and sorceries, and fornications, and thefts. So all those crimes are similar crimes, of course, that we come out in Revelation 17 and 18. Um, but just to pick up on a couple of them, here's one of my favorites. There's Santa Claus for you, uh, St. Nicholas. This is his reliquy, which is where they collect the bones that are left after he's died and decarnated, as they call it in the Middle East, so all the, the meat's gone, and what's left is just the bones. They collect them, and they put them in a reliquy, which is a golden uh, enclosed tomb that holds the relics, right? And so you can see there different reliquies of a foot and a hand and a, and a head of different people, um, and that's Bishop Nicholas of Nicaea. So, but the interesting thing is that these, this idolatry is all tied to false religion. Because it's based on the idea of the immortal soul, right? So the idea is that Santa Claus is up in heaven, and he's ascended there, and, and we can pray to him, and he will then do miracles. And the, the miracle that he's supposed to have performed is kind of gross. Um, there was four school children that were murdered and dismembered and put in pickling barrels, and somebody prayed to him, and he reassembled them all. They all came back to life, and hence, you know, he's a really cool guy. Um, and that's why people like Santa Claus. Well, that in the presence and everything else and coke and stuff like that. But nonetheless, that's, that's where he kind of comes from, right? So every single Roman Catholic altar has to have a real relic in it. Meaning that they must have, not a pretended one, not a, not a piece of cloth that Elvis or uh, whoever wore, right? But it has to be a literal piece of the body that is certified by a specific department in the Roman Catholic Vatican head of operations. Right, so when it talks about dead men's bones, right, this is this is whited sepulchres full of dead men's bones. It's a fairly literal thing. Well, that's what these uh, forces in Revelation are going to go out against. Idolatry. Well, here's the rebranding. This is the god Janus here. Um, it was part of the pantheon for the Romans. It's the god of war. Along came Constantine and some of the others and said, like, man, that's an awfully cool statue. We can't really just smash this thing. How about we just call it Peter, and we'll pray to it instead, and we'll take the pagan name off it, and that's exactly what they've done. And uh, you can see here, in fact, that, you know, there she is kissing the toe of this thing, and it's so worn out there that you actually it's been kissed so much that it's, that it's totally smooth. Um, that's the worship of these idols. So this is the kind of people that this group is going to go out to attack. Well, the first of them is the Seljuk Turks. So this is the first of the four angels that will go out and will bring about judgment upon the Byzantine Empire. They're the first group that would break over the river Euphrates, because remember, this is part of the prophecy that they're going to, these are the powers that are behind the river Euphrates. They're going to overflow it, and they're going to bring judgment upon the idolaters. So the first group that overflows is the Seljuk Turks. They're led by a guy named Togrel Beg. I'm glad my parents were not familiar with those names, um, because I don't think I would have liked it. Um, so we're talking about the period of about 1038 to 1295, is when the Seljuk Turks really are in operation. They come from a group, and you've probably heard some of these names. They're, they're called the Mamelukes. 
Uh, well, the Mamluks are the, the soldier slaves that the Muslims had brought in. The court often works this way. You know, history comes, so this is what happened to the Roman Empire. You know, the, the Romans got a little fat and lazy, and you know, they're too busy enjoying the spa and whatever else. So we don't want to go out and do the fighting. We'll hire mercenaries, right? We'll bring other people in, and they can do the fighting. We'll just sit back and eat peeled grapes, right? So that works a while until the people do all the fighting go, wait a minute, why are we doing all the fighting and they're eating the peeled grapes? Why don't we go kill them? We'll take over, right? So that's kind of what happened in the Roman Empire. And that's exactly what happens here. The Mamelukes um, were brought in by the Abbasid Empire to prop up the Caliphs. Because the Caliphs are big, fat, lazy guys who don't want to get out there and do any of the killing themselves. So they bring in these slave soldiers... And those are the ones who are going to run the empire for them while they're at the spa. So, one of the clans of this group, or this Seljuk group, and um, they were already Muslims, by the way. And so, um, they come out and they begin to break with the, uh, the Abbasid Empire. One of their uh, great leaders is this guy named Seljuk Bey. And uh, he was... Uh, a hero, after which the Seljuk Turks are named. Quite the awesome sword he's got there. Um, but he basically, in 985, split off the clan, and um, he was the one that would really begin this whole process. And uh, it's one of his grandsons, a guy named Togrol, who we just talked about, or and uh, another one named Shangri after him, who basically came with the Seljuks from what is today eastern Iran, and they moved into the area of Afghanistan and Turkmenistan, and then they came down into the area of the Abbasids. So they, they migrate across, uh, Togrol Bed there, comes all the way down, and uh, they bring their tribes from Iran down to Baghdad, they, they throw the place uh, over, and they take over it. So they're Sunni Muslims, right? They're not Shias. They fight against the Shias, and um, they come along and basically take this whole place over. Interestingly enough, um, it's uh, Arp Aslan that comes along next. This is the, um, the, uh, the descendant of Togrol Beg. Um, because what happens is that he, Togrol marries into the Abbasid Empire. He marries the daughter of one of the last caliphs. And so when he does that, he forms an alliance with the caliphs. Well, the caliphs, if you remember, going back into history, or prophecy really, are part of that destroying angel clan. So it's once he marries into the Caliph family, it's the very next year that the, the Muslims under uh, the Seljuk Turks and Af Arslan, his nephew, cross over the Euphrates in 1063, and they go on to uh, the area of Palestine, down into Jerusalem, or Syria, down into Jerusalem, and then they go up way north into the area of Anatolia, or, or what we would call today modern-day Turkey, which is all the Byzantine Empire, and they start laying the smack down there, and basically trying to get rid of the, these Byzantians. So uh, they overflow in the year 1063, and um, the Battle of Manzikert is held, and uh, Af Arslan uh, takes the Byzantine Emperor prisoner, and begins to devour the Byzantine Empire itself. So it's a it's a pretty cool time. You think, well, that's way history. I have no idea about any of this. Actually, you do. Um, because this is also the time period of the Crusades. Because it's during this time, the first crusade is ordered by Pope Urban II. And a guy named Godfrey of Bouillon uh, is the leader of the first uh, crusade. And um, he becomes the first king of Jerusalem. And you've probably heard of the kingdom of heaven, right? The, the crusader kingdom in Jerusalem for a period of time. And uh, he was a, a, um, a descendant of Charlemagne. He was joined by a guy named Raymond of Toulouse. And against him, of course, came the infamous Saladin. So if you've ever heard of Saladin and the battle for Jerusalem, these guys are all out of that time period that's under the time period of these Seljuk Turks. And so anyway, this whole battle takes place, and of course they are joined again by Richard the Lionheart, who of course lost, and um, that was sort of this, this period of the Crusades that was going on. Well, that was the first of these powers that would overflow the Euphrates and would flood into the area of Palestine, really, and uh, devour up the area of the, the Byzantine Empire. Not to be outdone, though, a new wave of forces overflowed the Mongols, that is, uh, led by Genghis Khan and his successors. So they would come around the year 1227, 
and they would occupy till around 1304. And um, as this one empire is sort of petering out, the next guys come along, right? That's always the way it is. You know, people have their day in the shade or in the sun kind of thing, and then they kind of like wax and wane, and then they're off the scene, and then, you know, the next great group comes along. I mean, when was the last time the Edmonton Oilers won a Stanley Cup? Like, who's ever heard of them, right? You know, but when I was a kid, it was all Edmonton Oilers. I mean, it was great because we lived next door in Prince George, but, you know, that was the big thing. But, like, today, Edmonton Oilers, like, what? You know, and so that's the same thing it was back then. Like, there was groups of empires that would come, and then they would disappear off the scene, and they'd be gone. So along come the Mongols then, and then Genghis Khan or Chinggis Khan, or depends on how you want to put 50 different spellings, which works for me, because I can't spell anyway. Um, so Genghis Khan comes along. He's the first Mongol emperor, the great Khan, and he unites all the Mongols and Turkish tribes and basically becomes the supreme Khan in 1206, and he invades China, starts there, and uh, the Qin dynasty takes over the area of Peking, and he goes into Russia, Burma, Central Asia, Iran, and the Near East. And he creates this massive empire. And they had their own version of the Pony Express that would run backwards and forth. They built roads all through the place. And they could get a message from one side of the empire to the next as fast as a horse could run. Because they would literally have one horse to the next to the next. They would have posts all the way through. And they would travel through the whole area. Well, Genghis Khan was an interesting individual. Because his religion, although it wasn't Islamic, it would become, much of the, the, his followers would become Islamic, they believed in one God. And they were opposed to what they believed were impious fools of Europe who believed in these, these uh, multiple gods. And um, so the only thing that they really had was this idea of one God, and uh, his presence fills the whole earth and the universe, and these are their standards. And they would go out and they would lay the smack down in their own way. And this is how they used to do it. The first RVs, right? These are the yurts, right? These massive mobile homes. Um, so these are the trailer trash coming out of Asia, so to speak, right? Bringing all their, their hordes with them. And uh, they lived in these massive, huge mobile homes dragged by oxen. And they would come and they would lay siege to these cities. And you can see there them using the Greek fire because they'd gone down into, Tur into uh, China and they learned all about gunpowder, and it was really cool. So, you know, having sort of taken over that whole area, they brought gunpowder from China to the Middle East and into Europe. And that's really interesting, because this should actually be Revelation 9, but just open Revelation chapter 9, because how were these people supposed to operate? Well, Revelation chapter 9 tells you what they're supposed to be doing. We read there, uh, Revelation 9, and we're coming in at the 14th verse, where, 17th verse, sorry, I saw the horses of the vision, then that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone, the heads were like the heads of, uh, of horses, uh, like as the heads of lions, and out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone, and by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, by the brimstone which issued out of their mouth, for their powers in their mouth and in their tails. And their tails were like unto serpents, and they had heads, and with them they do hurt. Well, that's what John describes. What he's referring to is these machines that had power in their mouths and in their tails that would issue out fire. Because the Mongols would introduce the cannons into battle in Europe. And so you didn't have anything like this before they came along. You had Greek fire, where they would sling it from the, the old catapults. That was about the only thing that was similar. Now they brought these things. They're handheld. So you can see some of the, the handheld three-barrel cannons there. So literally, you would have this in your hand, riding your horse, and you would shoot it at somebody, and actually, you read accounts of how basically these cannonballs would fire out made of lead, and they would go through three people sometimes, you know, through the one guy and the next guy and the next guy. So the power would issue out of their mouths, and then they would have these toe-behind cannons, which were much bigger, the mounted cannons, as you can see there, and they would fire off their cannonballs, uh, the crouching tiger on the right-hand side had little cannonballs that were full of gunpowder. They would light them, they would shoot them off, and when they would land, they might just roll around, then they would explode. Um, and so they brought this onto the scene, which was, you know, as we call it today, a game changer. And it certainly did change the game. Well, again, I'm glad my parents weren't totally familiar with these guys, because Agadai um, is the next one that comes along, the, the Khan's son, Genghis Khan's son. 
He takes over in 1227, and he expands the empire to the area of the steppes in Manchuria, um, and basically into southern Persia. He subdues the Indian continent, and um, while he's doing that, he appoints his uh, grandson, uh, Batu Khan, and he uh, is appointed by Agadai, and he goes out and forms what's called the Golden Horde, which you may have heard about. Uh, they go up into the area of Russia, they attack the area of Russia, and Kiev falls to them. They invade Persia, Georgia, and Armenia. In fact, this guy uh, did a really, really good job, and uh, the people up there were, were in fear of him for many years to come. Well, they went forward from there. The Mongols pushed into Europe, uh, into the Byzantine third of the empire, and, and going towards the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, they invaded Poland, Hungary, and Transylvania. Um, they fought against these guys, the Teutonic Knights, or the Templars, the Hospitallers, or whatever you want to call them, these different groups. And um, they went across Bohemia, Serbia, as we know it today, Austria, and right into the Holy Roman Empire. In fact, this guy was going to come against Vienna when he found or heard news that his, uh, his uncle had died, and then he had to go back to the great ceremony, um, because the law of the Mongols is when the Khan dies, all the... The main Khans have to come back, and then they will appoint their next one. So, at the gates of Vienna, and darn it all, have to turn around and head back. Because that wasn't what God had set out for him. Remember it says in Revelation? They're against one-third of the empire. That other part of the empire wasn't their domain. So, no different than Napoleon going into Russia. He got so far, but God says, no, 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 Napoleon, your judgment is to be in the area of France. So, that's a disaster, and he loses, and he has to go back. He tries to go into the Middle East, and God says, no, 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 that's not where you're supposed to go, so he loses there as well. But whenever he's in Europe, he does great and blows everybody to pieces until his time is done. That's why we call him Napoleon blown apart. So anyway, um, the third part of men is going to be slain by these guys. This is a battle of uh, the Mongols. Um, it, it kind of reminds you a little bit of ISIS, because the job was to, you know, prove that you had killed lots of Christians. So to do that, you had to take a tally of ears. And so you had to cut off their ears, put them in sacks, and bring them along to prove uh, to Batu that you had actually killed as many people that you had said you had killed. So this is the empire of Genghis Khan um, and his successors. It would extend across Eurasia. It would go down into what is today China, Korea, across the Caucasus, Central Asia, um, Eastern Europe, uh, Russia, and the whole area of the Middle East until eventually there would be people knocking right on the doors again of Byzantium. Okay, so here we have around the year 380. Again, the Mongols have sort of done their thing. They've died off the scene. The empire split up into different parts. And we then come to this period of the Mughals, or the Mughals as sometimes they are called. So this is uh, a few years on from Genghis Khan. Um, but they would actually exist in different places in India right the way till 1857. Um, but they, they basically were 35 years that Timur spent running around con conquering the whole area, moving into Persia, Baghdad, and northern Iraq, and so on and so forth. And again, he brought with him his canons, and you can see them there in the background. So these are just secular books that they're depicting. They're dragging these massive canons behind elephants and oxen and goodness knows what else. And they would bring them into India. He invaded Persia um, and uh, basically followed the course of the Tigris and the Euphrates. And uh, he went on basically to the area of Hindustan on the one side and entered into Delhi. So you had one taking over China. This guy takes over Delhi. And um, he would come right the way through. And um, he would begin to do battle with this other empire that was growing that we're going to talk about, which is the Ottoman Empire. And he would fight with the Sultan down in Egypt. He would invade Syria. And he would attack Aleppo. These are all names we're familiar with today. This place has been bashed back with some fords over the years. Damascus. And uh, then he would go and fight with the Christians in Armenia and Georgia. And um, 600,000 of the people are captured and enslaved. And then he would invade Baghdad in June of 1401. And capture the city and 20,000 of its citizens are massacred. Not exactly a nice guy. In fact, um, the cruelty of the Mughals is basically enforced by the fact that they had to, again, 
have their tally of heads, right? So you think of ISIS and this whole head chopping thing. Well, they're not the first people that have done this. After the period, uh, after their, their great campaigns, they would create these huge pillars or pyramids of heads. So after a period of seven centuries, Damascus is reduced to ashes, as it is again today. And in his return from the Euphrates, he delivered Aleppo to the flames, and Baghdad shared the same fate. So uh, he would actually go and he would capture at one point in time the, the sultan of the Ottoman, growing Ottoman Empire, and this great uh, empire was basically uh, overrun. Um, and uh, he was its Bajazet, and uh, at the time he was trying to siege Constantinople, but it wasn't time for that yet. So uh, he had to break off and attack Timurlane and uh, clash with him. But he fought as well with the Hospitallers in Smyrna. So you think of the letters to the Ecclesias. This is in Turkey. And uh, again, approaching the area of Byzantium. And um, he was the warrior of Islam. So he fought against these people all the way through. Well, that brings us then um, to this, this whole empire that would grow. And you can see it there. Um, he went right the way up into uh, the north. He fought against the Ottomans, um, down into Syria, Damascus, and Egypt, all the way across into India and as far as Delhi. I remember I said you, you actually do know about this guy because it's one of his descendants um, that would build, it's his great-great-grandson that would build um, the Mughal dynasty, and um, he would build the Taj Mahal. And it was a, uh, a mausoleum for his wife. And... Um, of course, we know the story of uh, the fact that, you know, when they went to this place, this great thing that they built, the guy who built it, he didn't want him to build anything so nice again, so he ended up uh, chopping his hands off so that he couldn't build anything else. But the guy asked for just 30 minutes with his creation before he did this, and he went, and nobody knows how he did it, but he made a leak in the ceiling, and every time it rained, it would drip exactly on the grave or on the, the tomb of this guy's wife. So, you know, he kind of had his own back. Um, but anyway... It was there right the way through until the Brits came in, um, in 1847, um, and that's when they finally pushed back the Mughals, or the Mughals as they're sometimes called. But the Ottoman Turks then are the ones that really want to focus on, because this is the, the group that was in existence when brothers and sisters first were around. Uh, the Turkish Empire was, was at its, not its height, but it was at its full extent, or a great extent anyway. Timur had basically attacked them, but they had kind of pulled themselves together, and Bajit's son, Muhammad I, Bajit was the one that Timur had attacked, began to sort of decide, okay, we need to build up the Ottoman Empire. We need to really kind of pull this, this place together. So they crossed the river Euphrates, and um, they captured different places. Adrianople reunited with the uh, Ottoman Empire in 1421, and... Um, they came against the Ottoman Empire, or the, uh, the Byzantine Empire, against Constantinople, but they lost their first round. And um, so here you have Muhammad II, so this is 1402, and he's a very young ruler. In fact, he's 19 years old when he takes over, so he's just a teenager. And so you can imagine being a teenager in charge of an empire, everybody's going to look at you and go like, what, we've got to listen to this guy? So he's got to make his name. So he says, okay, I've got to do something like pretty amazing in order so that people are actually going to listen to me, right? So what he decides he's going to do is he's going to take Constantinople. Islam has, has you know, Genghis Khan has tried, Tamerlane's tried, a whole bunch of people have tried over the ages. So if I can take Constantinople, that'll make me a name that everybody will remember. So uh, what he does is he begins by building this fort um, in 1452 in July. So this is basically over the Bosphorus, so he could cut it off from the rest, so, you, so what he's trying to do is kind of contain the Ottoman Empire and cut it off from any supplies from the Black Sea and all the lands that the, the Byzantines had up in that area. So this is the first thing he does, is build this throat, or throat cutter it's called. And um, just to give you an idea of the map, just so you kind of know what we're talking about. So the Bosphorus is up here, so Crimea is somewhere up here on the roof, right? So this is the Bosphorus and the Black Sea is all over here. Uh, the Sea of Marmara is right there. And... Um, uh, Constantinople is right here, Byzantium, and uh, Anatolia is down here, so this is the area of what is Turkey today. And he builds his fort up here, uh, right on the shores of the, uh, the water, so that no ships can come from the Bosphorus to help Constantinople. Okay? 
So that's the first thing that he does. He kind of cuts off their, their ability to come in on this area of, of land. So then he decides, okay, we're going to bring our soldiers down and we're going to take uh, Constantinople. Uh, so this is a map of Constantinople. Here's the Emperor Constantine the 12th, or the 11th, sorry, interesting, the first Emperor is Constantine. The last Emperor's name is Constantine, just like Rome. The first emperor, Emperor's name is Romulus. The last Emperor's name is Romulus. Um, so same thing is, is holding true here in Constantinople. So he brings his ships down uh, to, the, to the area in the bay here, and uh, what he runs into is this massive chain. If you go to Istanbul today, the chain is still there in a museum. Um, so they wrote this idea, this whole port, like it's right here, right the way across with this massive chain so no ships could come through. You could not pass through, and of course they didn't have submarines back then. So he's got his 70 ships. What's he going to do? He spent a fortune getting all these ships together. So Muhammad decides, okay, we're not going to be undone. Um, we're going to take the ships apart, and we're going to carry them overland and put them in the sea on the other side. Uh, being as I run the empire, everybody has to do what I say, so that's what we're going to do. So that's exactly what they did, and they took their ships overland, and they basically carried them and put them on the other side, so that they would be able to take over this whole area. He then brings his forces in and surrounds Constantinople, which sits out in the sea, and um, he brings into the north, um, he's got his, uh, the troops that were led by Zango Pasha, one of his leaders, they basically are behind the ships there, so the ships are in the water here and the troops are up in the north. He then brings in to the, the rest of it his European army uh, to the north, his elite janissaries in the middle, and he, of course he's a, he's a great ruler, he, he sends them in last, he sends all the young guys in, cannon fodder first, and save your best troops for last once you've worn the enemy down, and then bring them in at the very end. And his national army then he has in the south. So he basically covers this whole area and is going to bring these forces against them. And he decides we need something that we can get through the walls of Constantinople because it is an impregnable city. So he commissions an engineer, a guy named Urban, to produce a cannon that is capable of projecting a stone bullet weighing 600 pounds about a mile. Okay, It took three months to build this thing. So they spent three months building this cannon that could only be fired three times a day because it took so, it heated up so much. If you fired it more than three times a day, it would explode, right? So it could be fired three times a day. It took 30 wagons to move the thing by oxen, six teams of oxen, basically, that were linked together, and 200 men on both sides. It took two months to bring it 150 miles. And so he brought this massive cannon with him right the way up to the walls of Constantinople. Now, it's interesting because, again, in Revelation chapter 9, we read there, the power is in their mouths and in their tails, and with them they're going to do hurt. And, of course, Brother Thomas writes about this in Eureka. He says, these lion-headed horses roared and vomited in fire, smoke, and sulfur out of their mouths were cannons belching forth destruction. And he says this is how John sort of describes it, and something he'd never seen. He saw these artillery-mounted breastworks actively at work, and the nature of their activity he signifies with sight and smell. It talks about the hassinth and the, the idea of the flash of the, the cannon bursts and, and the smell of sulfur. The smell would be highly sulfurous owing to the composite of matters vomited out and the roaring mouths of these great guns. So this is the, the great groups that brought this, this power together. And you can see some of the different artillery there. That's one of the, uh, it's called the Tsar gun. It's actually in, uh, I believe this one's in St. Petersburg. Could be Moscow as well, but it still exists today. But that's about the same size of um, the cannon that was built. And so they would they would throw this this fire and brimstone out of their mouths, and uh, they brought them against the city of Constantinople, April the sixth, fourteen hundred fifty three, and the siege lasted fifty three days. And there's different paintings that people have put together uh, these great cannons firing holes into these walls. They're about a hundred feet deep. Um, and four miles in length. Um, Gibbon says the great cannon of Mahabin, Muhammad had been separately noticed, and uh, basically it was fired on by everything they could fire on it, so they built this sort of covering around it, and uh, they just kept on firing and firing and firing, um, and basically until the walls uh, collapsed.
the cannons are actually still there in Turkey today, and you can go see them. Um, they still exist. Evidence of the truth of the Bible. Well, the whole mass of the Turkish army uh, coming against uh, Constantine, the 200,000 thousands, is described as the myriads. Uh, Muhammad is, is uh, or uh, Muhammad is there, and this Constantine, the last emperor of Byzantium, what is he going to do? Well, remember what it says in the scripture, they repented not of their, their, um, their uh, idolatry. So, what Muhammad does is he says to the Christians, he says, listen, he says, before we, we wipe you out, we're going to offer you a truce. If you give up, we will, we will and, and you decide, or you convert to Islam, and are circumcised, or pay the tribute, um, then we'll let you live. But if not, we're just going to murder you all. And um, it says they repented not of their idolatry. So early in the morning of the last day, a great procession of priests, men, women, and children formed outside St. Sophia's Cathedral. The most holy icons of the city were brought out from the shrines and chapels, as well as the icons of the Virgin Mary, and they carried forth the bones of the saints, girded with jewels and crosses containing fragments of the true cross itself, which they say they've got enough pieces of it to build the ark. But anyway, the bishops and the priests in their broad vestments led the way. And, of course, Constantine himself, they walked around the walls of the city, praying to the saints to uh, save them from this tragedy that was about to be unleashed. But, of course, it wasn't going to work, and the walls were breached on the 29th of May, 391 years after the angels crossed the river Euphrates. Muhammad II goes into the city, and Constantine who's depicted there holding the sword, uh, went out himself to join the battle, and he was slain. So that was the end of the Byzantine Empire. It was done. It was absolutely finished. Um, it was completely brought into oblivion. In fact, his niece, Sophia, grabbed what she could. She took the ivory throne and some of the vestments and the crown and whatever, and she went up. Um, well, she fled to the Pope at first, and then he married her off to the, to the Russian king, Ivan III, and, of course, their son became the first Tsar, Caesar of the Russians, and it became the third Rome. Well, that's a whole other story altogether. But this was Muhammad in his entrance into the city, and his empire then would spread right the way through Europe. Um, and it goes as far in, in the east into Algeria, um, all the way south. Uh, Mecca and Medina are all covered by it. What is today Iran, Iraq? Um, all the way up into the north and, and right up close to Vienna. So you can see there the growth of this area of, of, of land. But again, the accuracy of the scripture is incredible because the time period is given. It's not like we don't know how long this was supposed to be. Revelation chapter 9, verse 15, as we looked at, said that this is going to be for an hour, a day, a month, and a year. And that time period, as we worked it out, is 391 years. Now that's the principle, and that's what's laid out. Well, in the year 1062, that's when Togrel Beg married into the Abbasid family, and it was following that point that he could overflow the river Euphrates. And so it was that after his marriage, um, they overflowed the river Euphrates, 1062, add the four, 391 years to it, and amazingly enough, you come out with 1453, which is the exact year in which the Byzantine Empire fell. Now that's the accuracy of the scriptures. Absolutely and completely remarkable. 391 years from when they overflowed the river Euphrates until the time period when that whole system of things would be done away with, and the judgment of God would be complete. Now, based on the understanding of that, is how Brother Thomas wrote what he wrote in Eureka and Elpis Israel about the drying up of the river Euphrates, and how he correctly predicted the fact of the nations who would be involved in doing it, is all tied into these prophecies. And again, those words of Isaiah 46 remind us of this, that God declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel is going to stand. 
So when we now stand on what we've looked at, and I appreciate it's a lot of history that we've kind of plowed through here, but you see that this is the, the words of the prophets, the words of the Apostle John, and they're working out in history, is brings an accurate picture of what world history would be. Believers who lived in that time period, these would have been the notable signs of the times for them. When they saw Muhammad doing what he was doing, they would have recognized. And because they weren't Trinitarians, guess what? They were not put to the sword. Because they were not idolaters. They didn't worship idols. They didn't collect relics. They didn't shave their heads and, and, and worship the Trinity. They believed in one God only. Now, they were persecuted by the Trinitarians for that belief. But by Islam, they were actually... Uh, looked after. In fact, so were the Jews to a degree. Um, Muhammad kind of fell out, fell out with them because he thought that they would give him a little bit support, more support than they did. But the Jews, generally speaking, were able to operate within uh, Islam, Islamic lands because they believed in one God. They did not believe in three gods, and therefore they were not considered to be infidels in the same way. And Christians, who were true believers, who didn't believe in the Trinity, were treated the same way. So when you look at that, you recognize that God's hand has been at work throughout the whole of history. And this is spanning millennia. 600 uh, AD, 632 is when Muhammad started, going through to 932. This then kicks in, brings us to 1453. It's been over this great long period of time. And God's hand has been at work during this whole period of time. Well, what we find next is that once then this has been laid, this has all taken place, we get to the vials, and we're not going to spend our time looking at the first six vials at all. We're going to jump, or our first five, we're going to jump right into the sixth. Because the river Euphrates overflowed, this is what it was all about. And based on that, when early believers came to read about the river Euphrates being dried up, they said, okay, well if that was it overflowing, then the drying up must mean that the Ottoman Empire has to go, and what it's going to do is bring about the kingdom of God eventually. And God willing, that's what we'll look at in our next two sessions.